So I'm hoping what my presentation is going to do today is build upon what Martin's talked about in terms of the challenges um, with regard to implementing psychedelic research in Australia. And I'd like to start off by telling you a story. It's a story about uh, a psychologist um, who about 12 years ago had graduated, was bright-eyed and bushy-tailed working in Western Australia with people with alcohol and other drug use issues. And uh, he quickly became aware that there was this really high incidence of people presenting with alcohol and other drug use problems who had trauma. And the more complex trauma they experienced, the more uh, difficulties that they had the, the, uh, their prognosis was worse with the increased complexity of trauma and the trauma syndrome. And I was, and this was being seen over and over again. Um, and so this psychologist thought, well, the way to move forward with this is we need to, we need to work in an integrated fashion. And the way forward to work in an integrated fashion was to work, uh, to, to get further training and work as a clinical psychologist. Um, if you haven't figured out by now, I'm talking about myself in third person. <laughs> it's okay, I'm not insane. I, I know a very good psychologist that's tested me and confirmed that. <laughs> and that was me. <laughs> I was accepted into the Curtin Masters clinical training program, and in doing so, they offered me to combine it with a PhD, um, which seems like a, 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 a lot of work, but um, at the time, they said, well, if, if you do the PhD with the, with the master's degree, we'll pay for your master's degree, and we'll give you a scholarship. So I thought, that sounds great. I'm going to do that. <laughs> um, the only question was, what was I going to do my research on? And I'd noticed when I was speaking with my peers and colleagues in psychology and, and just in general, that there was this incongruence between uh, their understanding of the toxicity of alcohol and other drugs and the actual nature of the toxicity of these drugs. And they seemed to be thinking that, you know, this war on drugs was doing a pretty good job. It was working quite well. And so that's what led me to take a critical approach because it forces, the critical approach forces us to, to look in the mirror. It looks at how psychology or social work or medicine and other professionals cling on to ideas that are self-serving, often that are influenced by society and those in power. And that, that, that felt pretty good to me because I'm a bit of an anti-authoritarian. And because with critical theory, what it's really asking is how is our profession, by clinging on to these self-serving ideas and theories, how is that potentially disempowering people? And hence, um, the people that I was seeing who were quite disempowered had experienced trauma and were stigmatised uh, as being people who, as, as drug users, or as I'd prefer to say, people who use drugs. And it, uh, it, 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 the bit about empowerment um, is quite ironic because when I start, entered into this idea of using critical theory, what I quickly realised was there was some irony there because the language and jargon of critical theory makes it almost inaccessible. And I spent my first couple of years just trying to understand what the hell critical theory was, using all these big words like ontology and epistemology and, and so on and so forth. And what I'm going to try and do today is, is make um, is, is, have, is talk you through my research and do my best to do it in, uh, in, in presented in a lay way. I mean, my ultimate plan was to smash the misinformation in psychology and in society more broadly regarding alcohol and other drugs through social, uh, sorry, through critical theory. And in particular, I took uh, the social constructionist approach, um, which is a theory that suggests that 
What's deemed as to be truth, what's deemed to be real, is jointly constructed through individuals within their society through our interactions. And there's two schools of, of social constructionism. There's the fundamental, fun, fun, fundamentalists who believe that there is no objectivity because of our inherent subjectivity. And um, there's the more moderate social constructionists who say, they say they're, they're, there is an objective world, but we can never truly know what that world is um, or see or understand that world because of that inherent subjectivity that we bring to it. At a famous conference about 15 years ago, they were, they were debating this, this out and someone went, that there, objective reality. The fundamentalist uh, gave a very, um, uh, a, a very long and, and academic um, explanation as to why, uh, you know, that, that was being, this could not be uh, objective reality because of the subjectivity. I decided to take uh, the approach that, yeah, this, this, there, there is this objective reality out here, um, but we do have difficulties in, under, in, in truly understanding what the objective reality is because of our subjectivity. So alcohol and other drugs have objective pharmacological effects, but they are also social constructions. These constructions of alcohol and other drugs limit what can be reasonably said about alcohol and other drugs. And that's why there are limitations in terms of what is talked about in the media when it comes to alcohol and other drugs. And because views of reality are culturally embedded, those views dominant at any time and place will serve the interests and perspectives of those who exercise the most power in a particular culture. So alcohol and other drugs are chemical structures. There are objects. I've pictured a couple here. Molecules like water and oxygen. Although in this case I've pictured alcohol and methamphetamine because unlike water, uh, water's probably, uh, methamphetamine and alcohol are probably more likely to have stronger social constructions. There's going to be more subjectivity and a less uh, uh, more of a barrier and a filter between that objective reality and what we deem to be true. So there was a study by David Moore, um, and he, 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 he talked about drugs having particular personalities, um, and it, or drugalities, as he says. And so alcohol is a bit of a larrikin, as you can see, with Bob Hawke having a, having a beer. Heroin it has, it is a bit oppressive in its, in, its, in its nature. And maybe ice is a bit of a sociopath and a little perverse. So social constructionism is underpinned by language. And in doing so, it's underpinned by this notion of dominant discourses, which are linguistic frameworks. And the dominant discourses are those that hold the most truth value. Each discourse is supported by a dominant institution that has a vested interest in maintaining the status quo. By, by maintaining the, that status quo, they maintain their power. So what might be some of these institutions? This is just one of many institutions. There's medical institutions that have vested interest, pharmaceutical institute, in terms of pharmaceutical, the pharmaceutical industry. And so what I'm going to hopefully do now is um, So it's not, is, is, is highlight that these dominant discourses highlight how they can limit what we can think, say, and, and what research can be done about a given topic, such as alcohol and other drugs. So I've got a little diagram. This is the first time I've tried using this diagram to explain uh, this very um, complex and impenetrable theory of critical analysis in psychology. So basically, 
What I'm trying to demonstrate here is that within a discourse, one of these red circles, a object is uh, constructed. And so, for example, within a medical discourse, which is um, supported by the medical institution. Drugs are constructed as, as pathogens, as dangerous. And in turn, that leaves uh, the availability of particular subject positions within narratives that can be talked about, the way we talk about um, alcohol, the way we talk about drugs in society. And so the subject positions available within the medical discourse are those of um, the sick person who, after being exposed to the pathogen of a drug, develops the disease of addiction. Um, or they can be deemed as quite irrational people because why on earth would somebody take a dangerous drug? And this really disempowers the person who's using drugs. And it's in the vested interest of medicine and or the medical institution to maintain this discourse as it gives them power. It, it helps them it helps them control what's true. And these discourses interact with one another. So my PhD uh, found that there were four primary dominant discourses in Australia, and they all kind of say the same thing that drugs are bad. So in medicine, drugs are bad because they're pathogens, they're dangerous. Uh, with regard to uh, moral, with, oh, I pressed the wrong button here. <laughs> with regard to moral discourse, um, the drugs are constructed as corruptive so that if you're exposed to them, they might, um, they might corrupt you morally or they're even evil. And again, this limits the subject positions with, with, within which people can be um, placed within the narratives when we're talking about people who use drugs or, that we're, or talking about drug use in general. And it interacts with the medical model because people who are morally weak need help. They need treatment. They need treatment from medical experts. But in essence, the moral discourse says that people who use drugs are bad. Legal discourse constructs uh, the drugs as contrabands and the subjects as criminals. And political discourse continues with the idea that drugs are dangerous and it's their job. In fact, it's their, it's their job to protect us from these dangerous drugs. And hence, while we see moral panics emerging within moral discourse and the political response to that is to save us all by banning more of them. So these discourses um, demarcate what Tupper refers to as drugs versus non-drugs. So what I've talked about so far are the dominant discourses of drugs in Australia. This does not apply to caffeine, alcohol, tobacco or pharmaceuticals. It can do at times, but there is this demarcation made, this dichotomy between drugs and non-drugs. Um, if you had asked me in 2008 when I conducted this study if cannabis might be considered a non-drug, I would have thought you were a little, a little crazy. We're, we're moving towards clinical trials of cannabis. So it's being framed now, it's being moved from a drug to a non-drug. It's being able to be taken out of that drug discourse and talked about in a different way. And, and the first step in that has happened. The TGA only a few days ago has moved to propose that cannabis be moved from Schedule 9 along with heroin, cocaine and uh, methamphetamine to schedule eight with other medicines like morphine, dexamphetamine, Ritalin. And this is, um, this is, this is what we need to do. Good one, Steve, we'll try, try that again. This is what we need to do in terms of psychedelics. We need to shift 
the dis we need to shift the way in which we talk about them so that we are framing them as non-drugs, as pharmaceuticals, as medicines, so that they are not framed within the dominant discourses of drugs that are so entrenched within Australian society. And this has been done very well by MAPS, I think, in the US, but it's taken them years. MAPS was started in 1986, and we're looking at 2021 for, for it as a medicine. So this is a long process of chipping away at these deeply ingrained constructions. Um, so how do we do that? Well, I thought it, I think it's great that I've seen this recent um, this this recent um, idea hashtag psychedelics because because it provides a way of talking about psychedelics outside of the dominant discourse. The problem with talking about drugs without outside of the dominant discourse is that drugs are framed within this pathological paradigm. And so if you talk outside of the patho pathological paradigm, then the information that you're presenting may be deemed as irrational or, or just simply incorrect, not untrue. And we see the pathological paradigm um, emerge in terms of the way that research is funded. Because research that conforms with the dominant discourse receives lots and lots and lots of money. Australia spends lots and lots and lots of money looking at the drugs and how they are dangerous. Not so much time spending money on what benefits there might be. Because drugs are not illegal because they're dangerous. They're perceived as dangerous because they're illegal. And we need to maintain that perception by funding studies that demonstrate that drugs are dangerous to maintain the status quo, to maintain the power structures that exist within contemporary Australian society and, and at, a, at a global level. I mean, we've, this is happening at the UN. Um, with, the, with, the, with the UN General Assembly meeting very soon to talk about the conventions that many countries around the world uh, have signed up to. So most research funding, as I mentioned, is spent on proving that drugs are dangerous. So how do we conduct psychedelic, so how do we conduct psychedelic research because it's not gonna come from the pharmaceutical companies because giving somebody a dose of MDMA and fixing them doesn't really fit with their business model of putting someone on an SSRI indefinitely. These dominant discourses don't just are just limited to drug research. And it highlights that as much as science likes to believe that it is, is, it is objective, it can never be completely objective. And psychology wants to be a science. Psychology really wants to be a science. <laughs> because if psychology is a science, then we have power, we can, uh, we can hold truth, that the information that we say is held with truth value. And really the father of, the, of, of psychology evolving as a science was William James, who, who was a philosopher. He wanted to understand how the mind worked. And he took an empirical approach. He took a scientific approach. And this included the use of nitrous oxide. And um, his use of nitrous oxide came to fruition uh, with some profound, some profound understandings of the mind, such as there are no differences but degrees of differences of degree between different degrees of difference and no difference. <laughs> Empirical evidence using nitrous oxide. <laughs> then, then came 
name's Sigmund Freud, and um, Sigmund was a, was a trained as a medical doctor, so he wanted, you know, he understood the idea of, of medicine and science, and he wanted to understand mental illness within a scientific and medical framework, and he's the, he, of course, developed psychoanalysis. But he was criticised for his lack of meeting scientific assumptions because many of his theories simply can't be tested. And the theories that he came up with were based on just, you know, some of his, obs his, his, his ideas and observations. They weren't based on the experimental method. This all changed quite, um, quite, for, quite randomly, really, with a, a German fellow called Ivan Pavlov, who um, used the experimental method to describe conditioning. And basically, conditioning is uh, the, the hallmark of how we understand learning within, within psychology. And uh, so to, to briefly describe it to you, an unconditional stimulus is the smell of food, an unconditional response is that you salivate. If I ring a bell at the same time as providing you with the food, um, you will, after time, if I repeat that over and over again, after time, if I just ring the bell, you'll salivate. If you want to find out how he came, came across this learning um, and you're a bit of an ethicist or an animal lover, I'd, I'd suggest that you don't delve too deeply into it. But what, what happened here was is that his research was replicated widely and extrapolated and became an essential theory of psychology and in particular psychotherapy. Then came a fellow called Ian Thorndike, who there are very few laws, and in fact I think there only is one law in psychology, and it's the law of effect. And the law of effect is that behaviours that produce a positive response in a situation will be more likely to occur again in that situation. So basically what he's talking about is reward and punishment, the law of effect. Then came the next scientist, Skinner, who extended Thorndike's work. He came up with the idea of positive and negative conditioning and positive and negative punishment. So positive reinforcement is when uh, you give a dog a treat, you tell a dog to sit, you give it a treat, that's positive reinforcement. Next time you tell the dog to sit, you give it a treat, it's positive reinforcement. If you just tell the dog to sit, then it sits on its own. The, there's, 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 the dog has been, con has, um, has been conditioned to engage in that behaviour in response to the stimulus of being told to sit. Negative reinforcement is when you take away something uh, when you take away something unpleasant. So when you take a Panadol when you have a headache, and if you, your headache goes away, then you're going to be more likely to take Panadol next time you have a headache. Positive punishment is when you inflict something negative upon somebody. Negative punishment is when you take away a six-year-old's Xbox. You're taking away something they like. But um, he became a bit of a fundamentalist uh, because he said that all human behaviour can be described by operant conditioning. There is no free will. Every behaviour you engage in from here on in is related to the operant conditioning that's occurred from your past. And in addition to that, he said, if you can't see it, you can't measure it. Therefore, the mind is not something to be researched. The mind's this black box we can't see into. So social psychology emerged in a response to this, um, to developing ways of understanding thoughts, emotions and behaviours. And in particular, how these thoughts, emotions and behaviours are understood by others. And so there's some famous experiments in social psychology, the Bobo doll, which shows social learning. Um, if you see um, somebody, if you see somebody, somebody um, being rewarded for a behaviour, 
then you're going to be more likely to engage in that behaviour yourself. And that experiment was conducted by getting kids to watch other kids beat up a Bobo doll, and um, some of them would be rewarded for it, some of them would, would, wouldn't, and then they'd see what the other kids would do. There was the Stanford Prison Experiment to highlight conformity. They got a bunch of people together, a bunch of participants, and they split them randomly into two groups. Some got to wear the prison guard uniforms, some got to wear the prisoner uniforms. The study had to be shut down because of the way in which people were starting to behave in the study. The Milgram experiment to highlight obedience. I won't go too much into detail into the experiment methodology, but people, when somebody was standing next to them with a white coat, would give a person who they believed was in another room who they could hear screaming, an electric shock that was deemed to be able, deemed to cause death. But there came the birth of critical theory because how does the experiments remain objective in these studies? Why is the researcher asking that particular question? Do they have personal bias? Uh, is there institutional conformity? Is it to do with the particular social milieu of the time? And if so, are we disempowering people through the research that we're doing? So we've talked about evidence-based um, evidence-based research. And this has been then extended to psychotherapy so that psychotherapy can be seen as a science. And there's randomised controlled trials. But these are underpinned by the aforementioned limitations. Why are we asking the question that we're asking? Why are we studying this particular treatment mechanism? Why are we studying this particular treatment? And in addition to this, people are complex. When we do a randomised controlled trial in psychotherapy, we exclude all the people that have um, any degrees of difference. So we end up with this very homogenous group. And it means that it lacks ecological validity. A lot of psychologists, when they hear the word evidence-based practice, oh. because my clients that present at my clinic have all of these problems that you excluded for your very homogenous population to ensure control over your study. So is psychotherapy an art rather than a science? The issue here is that people's careers are vested in the science of supporting their treatments. Institutions have been developed that have spent lots of money and have that money vested in maintaining the status quo. That becomes a problem if you want to introduce a different paradigm of treatment. And people will stick by their guns. Um, there's a particular researcher who doesn't like MDMA. And despite all the evidence that Martin's presented, he continues to, to, continues to write papers on how dangerous MDMA is because he staked his career on this. So in conclusion, dominant discourses limit what we vastly said about psychedelic drugs in society. Psychologists and psychiatrists often internalise these dominant and pathogenic narratives of alcohol and other drugs such as psychedelics, and there are vested interests in maintaining the status quo. That makes it very difficult to introduce new paradigms. So there needs to be an increased awareness of these issues in psychology and psychiatry to move forward with psychedelic research to lead the change in public discourse. And I talked about hashtag psychedelic benefits before, and I think there's a great example of, 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 of trying to challenge some of the entrenched misinformation that exists within our society. We are social workers. We are students. We are parents. We are substance abusers. We are scientists. We are lawyers. We are psychotherapists. We are Buddhist psychonauts. 
We are autonomous beings. We are scholars and intellectuals. We are entrepreneurs. We are psychonauts. We are symposia. We are not the stereotype. I was able to face my fears. I felt a connection to the world. I gave up drinking. I learned what compassion really means. I came to understand myself and my clients. I learned how to reduce my egoism. I found a new path for my life. I learned to live truer to myself. I explore the depths of my consciousness. I saw that we are all connected. I want to be a psychedelic therapist. I want the opportunity to cure my PTSD. I find myself while tripping on LSD. <laughs> Using psilocybin. With MDMA. With the help of ayahuasca. With 5-MeO-DMT. Through the use of MDMA and psilocybin mushrooms. Using psilocybin in an ayahuasca ceremony. Mushrooms in LSD. With psilocybin. With DMT. On LSD. Using MDMA and psilocybin. Psychedelics can enhance cognitive processes, enrich our understanding of culture, society, and the arts, and expand what it means to be well-educated. Ibogaine cured my alcoholism. I use psychedelics because I want to heal my soul. I support psychedelics because psychedelics allow us to address the root cause of our problems and not just the symptoms. I believe in psychedelics because LSD helped me be myself, become a happier person, and quit smoking. I tried psychedelics because I wanted to live life to the fullest. Psychedelics because they help me recognize the beauty in life. I support psychedelics because of the potential to heal others. I use psychedelics because they teach me how to love more deeply. I advocate for the research of psychedelics because how has learning more ever been a bad idea? I research treatments for mental illness and psychedelics because they have the potential for healing. I use psychedelics because they help me wake up and see clearly. I use psychedelics because they help me to explore my mind and be a better person. I'm fighting for the legalization of psychedelics because their prohibition infringes our human right to cognitive liberty. I use psychedelics because they give me inspiration. I use psychedelics because they bust my ego and slap me with the truth. I use psychedelics because it helps me look outside of the limits of my perspective. I advocate for therapy with psychedelics because it'll prevent suicide and save lives. Legalize psychedelics because of their profound ability to help others heal from their trauma. Psychedelics because they've instilled hope in me. Just on a finishing note, so, as, so psychology has some good treatments for some mental health issues, but we do not have good treatments for some conditions such as alcohol and other drug use, where we see low, high rates of, um, of relapse. We don't have good treatments for trauma. And as a psychologist, I, I would like to see the regulation of psychedelics so that there is another tool in my toolbox as a psychologist to be able to assist people and help people um, and improve their well-being and their functioning as, as, as humans. Psychedelics might also treat treatments for depression. We're, we're good at treating depression when it's mild, but really serious depression, psychology is not so good at treating because it's very, the, the people's ideas their, their belief systems are so rigid. Psychedelics have the opportunity to change those neural networks and allow people to see things from a different perspective. Psychedelic benefits. Thank you.